we all make decisions. We start at an early age with that decision-making process and we learn how to walk or crawl and we have a direction that we're going. And if you watch a little, a little, uh, a little kid just learning how to crawl, what do they push with their uh, uh, back feet until their butt goes up in the air and then the front goes out forward, then they get another grip, pretty soon they're crawling all over. Uh, by pushing themselves, they learn to roll from front to back and before long, uh, they're standing up and they're wavering a little bit and they take a cautious step They maybe fall, maybe they uh, give it another try, but they don't quit. They just seem to keep going and keep trying. I'm thinking, man, if I crashed as, some, as much as these little kids, you know, I think oh, this is just forget it. I'll just lie where I'm comfortable, maybe roll around a little bit, but they keep going at it and God gives us thankfully wipes out our memory that really doesn't stick until about what age four or five somewhere in there not many of us have too many sharp memories before that but we learn and we grow <clears throat> and the most of the growth comes not because we're intellectually convinced that we've reached a good decision it's because we've had a bad consequence something just didn't work out right like the first time i ever fell down the stairs that didn't work out right uh, and it hurt, made mental note, be more careful when going downstairs. Um, and those kinds of things, as we stumble across it, are all challenges in making right choices. The, uh, uh, my wife is an English teacher, and so I get to learn a little English along the way, even though it's been a long time since I've had English classes. And there's an expression that they teach in English classes, and one of them is called idioms. And idioms are expressions that take on specific meanings and are often culturally dependent. So an idiom in one country, a saying in one place, might be have meaning there but not in another place. And it's frequently hard to understand then an idiom in another language. I'm going to, uh, some examples of idioms that we're going to examine today involve making choices. So accordingly, the title to this message is an idiom. It's between the devil and the deep blue sea. And I'm going to give those five idioms and then five action points to help us to use to make decisions. Just as we saw in the camp video, they said we're at camp learning to make good decisions. So let's take a look at this first idiom, between the devil and the deep blue sea. Now the phrase was originally between the devil and the deep sea. And the, the, the blue part was added much later on. Uh, because there was this popular song that was written called Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea by Ted Keller and, and uh, Harold Arlen in 1931, recorded by Cab Calloway, if some of you remember the name. And <clears throat> what is the devil? Well, what he was referring to is the seam which is, be, uh, uh, is at the waterline on a ship. There's a seam from the upper part to the lower part of the ship. And this definition comes out of uh, a, 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 a alphabetical digest of nautical terms. An engineer and vessel constructor clarified it this way. The devil is the seam between the deck planking and the topmost plank of the ship's side. So there's the, the floor of the plank of the deck, and then there's an edge of the ship uh, on the ship's side. The seam would need to be watertight and would need filling or caulking from time to time. On a ship at sea, this would presumably require a sailor to be suspended over the side or at least stand on the very edge of the deck leaning over. Either way, it's easy to see how one might be described as being between the devil and the deep blue sea. Incidentally, another term for filling a seam is paying. So those like the nautical origins also give this as a source. They'll have the devil to pay. Although the evidence uh, uh, may not be heavy, but if you've got to go over and seal the edge, well, that's the devil to pay. The first recorded citation of the devil in the deep blue sea is in 1637 uh, in, a, in a book by Robert uh, Monroe. So you have the between the devil and the deep blue sea, we can picture that somebody's hanging over trying to get some work done, and they're in a very awkward position. Another idiom is on the horns of a dilemma. You might have heard of this one. 
Some years ago, I took my on Labor Day weekend, I took my wife to the Minnesota State Fair in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And about a, about a million people attend that fair. Actually, runs over a million every uh, 10 days, every year. About 100,000 people a day. And in the cattle barn, there was a, a bull, a Scotch Highlander breed bull. And he had very long curved horns. Think uh, uh, Texas Longhorn. As we approached this bull's pen, now there was a, a, a steel um, tubing to protect uh, the people that were observing from this bull. The, <clears throat> the bull took his horns and stuck them between the big metal pipes or tubing, and then he rattled them back and forth. So just as we're walking by, he reached out and ding 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 Now, of course, we about jumped out of our skin, jumping back. And, and then thankful the bulls only scared us, didn't really skewer us. Could have just hooked the horn right on through there, and, uh, and that, would have, uh, that would have been even more memorable. So what if you were in a bull ring, and you pictured a bull with the long pointed horns coming straight at you? Your self-preservation instinct would do what? Would most likely kick in right about that time, and you would decide whether you should move, or the bull would run into you, with his head. However, if you ran to the right, then the bull could simply throw his head to one side of your direction and skewer you with his left horn. If you went to the left, the bull could swing his head in that direction and then skewer you with the other horn. And surely standing still isn't a reasonable option either. Uh, so you have to choose to run in one direction or another. This puts you on the horns of a dilemma. No matter which way you turn, the consequences are likely not going to be good. This is also term is also used uh, in a as a form of logic or argument. Uh, a dilemma is which a participant finds himself in the embarrassing predicament of having to make a choice of either of two premises, both of which are obnoxious. It is a trap set by an astute person to catch someone who's unwary, like answering yes to or no to the question. Have you stopped beating your wife? Because one may be caught and impaled on either of the alternatives. If you say yes, I've stopped beating my wife, well, that means you have been beating her. If you say no, you haven't stopped, well, then you're continuing to do so, putting you on the horns of a dilemma. No matter how you answer, uh, it'll be an uncomfortable uh, consequence. The, uh, <clears throat> in 1548 is the earliest recorded uh, of this saying uh, in England. And um, they call it a forked question. <laughs> oh, how amazing, a forked question. Uh, and that was uh, uh, reduced uh, and quoted in a book called A Hog on Ice by Charles Funk. I've seen a hog on ice. It's not a pretty sight. I'm trying to get around. So we got on the horns of a dilemma. Then we have one called Hobson's Choice. And this idiom is the choice of taking either that which is offered or taking nothing at all meaning an absence of a real choice. In 1640 to 1650, Thomas Hobson of Cambridge, England, he rented out horses. He had a stable, and he gave his customer only one choice, the horse nearest the stable door. Well, what kind of a choice is that? You could have any horse you want as long as it's the closest one to the stable door. Sort of like Henry Ford uh, gave his customers who bought a Model T, he said, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Well, that really means no choice at all. The fourth idiom is a catch-22. This is a novel that he started writing uh, in 1953, and it was really about uh, World War II uh, by a, a Joseph Heller. He wrote a book called Catch-22. It was a satire. And it was a general critique of <clears throat> bureaucratic operation. And it means putting someone in a no-win situation or a double bind of any kind. And then the fifth idiom is between a rock and a hard place. The earliest known printed citation of between a rock and a hard place is the American Dialect Society publication that says to be between a rock and a hard place means to be bankrupt. It's common in Arizona in recent panics, sporadic in California. That was 1921. Well, there's a reason they came up with that expression back there. 
because there was a banker's panic of 1907. It was an economic uh, 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 depression, and it was dam damning to the uh, mining and the railroad business. So what happened was the copper mining and mine workers in Arizona, some of them had formed labor unions. And they approached company management with a list of demands that they had. Well, company management refused. Well, they were all living on company property and beholden to the company for their jobs. And so what did the company do? They put them on a train and sent them to New Mexico. End of problem. Well, the mine workers were faced with a terrible choice. Either be hard, uh, their treatment and conditions were harsh and they were underpaid, or they would have unemployment and poverty. So you have this between a rock and a hard place. The, uh, then in the Great Depression, that expression became more widespread because more and more people were unemployed, about one out of three workers in America. So we're looking at the difficulty people have in making choices and you're faced with a terrible circumstance. Well, let's turn to John 15, 16. In John 15, 16, you see, God also had choices to make. And God didn't have a problem choosing us to be in his family. He saw something in each and every one of us that we likely don't see in ourselves. And that is the capacity to honorably serve God. In John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. Notice the term, you shall bear fruit. Well, in order to bear fruit, to be followers of the true God, we're required to make right choices. We read the example of Joshua in the book of Joshua, 20, in chapter 24, and verse 14. In Joshua 24, and verse 14. <clears throat> and Joshua had a number of choices to make, and he had made them correctly over a 40-year-plus-year year period. And we look at the basis upon which Joshua made his decisions. In Joshua 24, starting in verse 14, Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, meaning the Jordan, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Bet us for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. We all know that sometimes it seems hard to follow God's ways. However, we must bear in mind that God first chose us. And now it's up to us to choose to follow God's instructions. So making these right choices is our life's task. And we face this task every day. Ultimately, God rewards those who follow him, knowing that we're imperfect because we've made a conscious choice to follow God. And then God will give us the ultimate in prosperity, which is life eternal, as we become part of God's family and rulers on the earth. In Psalm 25, what is our destiny? In Psalm 25 and verse 11, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it's great. Who is the man that fears the Lord? He, him shall he teach in the way life chooses. He chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. So it's an opportunity there for everyone. So now I want to. We've gone through the five idioms. Now I want to go through the five points on how to deal with making choices. <clears throat> so point one, take a breath, pause, avoid the panic. Take a look at Proverbs 19, verse 2. Point one is take a breath and pause, avoid the panic. In Proverbs 19, verse 2, also it is, and then there's a listing of instructions in Proverbs, and we come to verse 2, also it's not good for a soul to be without knowledge, and he, who, and he sins who hastens with his feet. In other words, running to a conclusion too quickly. Hastening with your feet. In other words, going and making that decision in a big hurry. And some people do make decisions too quickly. Others linger and they don't make a decision at all. And then they suffer for it because somebody else is going to make a decision. 
So we need to act uh, deliberately and with reasonable uh, uh, consideration. Uh, I approached my father on how to make a, um, uh, many years ago on how to make a big decision. And he said, before you make a really big decision, always make sure you sleep on it. Get a good night's sleep because the decision may look different in the morning if you have a really big one. So I've remembered that from my father and I've tried to make sure that if there's a really big decision, then then give it a moment to, to germinate and let the let the uh, let it come, my decision uh, come forth the next day. So point one is um, <clears throat> take a breath and pause. Don't panic. Point two is read the scriptures. Of course, we just read in Proverbs 19.2, it's not good to be without knowledge. That's a foundation. So we really need to have some knowledge. But let's look at Psalm 119 and look at in verse 103. In Psalm 119, verse 103, why would we need to read the scriptures? In verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Verse 104, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So what, do, what is this God's word gives us, um, gives us understanding? By getting the knowledge from God's word, by reading the scriptures, we get then light, a lamp to my feet. Now, I use a flashlight uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to feed my sheep in the morning because it's dark out. The sheep somehow... Don't need a flashlight, but I do. And so I use that uh, early in the morning to light my path. And I've told some people this uh, anecdote before. is growing up on a dairy farm, and it was supper time, and we didn't have milk in the milk pitcher. Okay, whose turn is it to run to the barn and get milk to bring back for supper? And, of course, once it's, you know, with four boys, one of them is going to eventually be my turn. And the yard light, which shone all around, all around the dooryard, was great. And you turn the yard light on, but you have to go around the corner of the barn to get into, into the dark shadow to get into the milk house door. So you take a five-quart ice cream pail, because that's, you know, you, you know the kind with the plastic pail with a little lid on it, and <clears throat> go down there, and everything is fine until you get to the edge where the shadow is. And now you've got to step from the light into the dark of the shadow and walk about 30 or 40 feet to the door. And if you, and then when you get to the door, you open the door and up there on the wall is the light switch. Then you're safe because right lights will shake, uh, chase away anything that's in the dark. So you go scoop the milk out, put it back, reverse the process, shut the lights off. You're in complete darkness now. Close the milk house door. And now around the barn, you can't even see the light yet, but you make your way around the barn and you can see the edge where the light is being cast from the yard light. And as soon as you can see the light, I'm sure my brothers have all done it, I break out into a run and run lickety split for the light. doesn't matter if it's dark. It doesn't matter how much milk you splash out of that bucket. <clears throat> you're going to make it. And then you think of all the stories that they told. You know, there's a little creek running right behind the grove. And the mountain lions and the bears, I really like to follow the creeks. Now, we've never seen one, but we've heard about it. And they're lurking in the shadows, and I would be a delicious morsel for these things. So as a kid, I'm running lickety-split. And of course, if you look behind you, the farther the light away is, and you're, uh, uh, you know, anybody, any size, you look behind you, your shadow looks like about 30 feet long. And so when you're a kid, you look behind you and you see this wavering monster coming after you no matter how fast you run. You cannot run fast enough to get uh, until you get to the middle of the yard and then you have a breather. You see, if you read the scripture, the word of God is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It shows the light, it casts away the shadow. I remember one time I, I made it to the house and my dad noticed the milk on my pants and half full bucket said, what's the problem? And I said, I'm uh, kind of afraid of the dark. And he goes, yeah, son, you never be afraid of the dark. You only have to worry about what's in the dark. So I was greatly comforted by that knowledge, knowing there really wasn't anything in the dark that I should be worried about. But God provides the light. We don't have to be afraid of the dark or even what's in the dark. 
when the light will cast out the darkness. So reading the scriptures is point two. Um, <clears throat> to build up our knowledge, that's referred to in the, in the first point in uh, Proverbs 19.2. The third point is ask for insight. Get help. In Proverbs 15.22, in Proverbs 15.22, we read, Without counsel, plans go awry. But in the multitude of counselors, they're established. You know, I made a lot of decisions in life that I didn't get advice on. And what do people need the most, and yet they accept the least, is advice. And it's still true, no matter what age I've discovered. Now, teenagers especially, um, uh, the younger children tend to cling to the parents. That's their safety. When you get to be teens... They all think they're mature and grown up and they don't need advice because they're, they're big kids and they're next to adulthood and they can make big people decisions. Well, the older you get, the more you realize you need the advice. And some people, uh, well, then we have to decide, well, where do you get your advice? Uh, where do young people get their advice? From other young people who have just as limited of experience as they do. So where should we get our advice? Well, our advice should come from those who make have made better decisions than we do, have more life experience to glean the wisdom from somewhere else, rather than asking advice from people who have a history of making worse decisions than we do. So point three is get wise counsel. The wise counsel can be any one of a number of places. It can be your parents. It can be uh, a career mentor. It can be from a book. Uh, it can be particularly... Uh, of the Bible it can be from a variety of sources, but get wise counsel. Um, <clears throat> I would not ask, um, uh, for example, a dentist on the correct way to cut my hair, and I would not ask uh, a plumber how should I wire up the fuse box on my house. Each one of them has a special area, so you ask people who have certain knowledge and skills in a particular area. Point four on decision-making. Recognize that we are to follow God's will. Recognize we're to follow God's will. Now, this sometimes is really hard to figure out what that is. Yet we must be open to the understanding that God's will does exist. Now, does God care whether or not you have a red car or a blue car or a green car or whatever? Generally not, unless there's a specific reason for it. So people can get carried away by thinking that that... They're devoid of having to make their own choices. No, God put us on this planet to make choices and to learn by those choices in order to think like him. So that doesn't mean that every little, should I clip my nails today or shall I do it tomorrow? Well, that's probably something you can handle. And a lot of the little decisions in life. Uh, now, when it's the really big decisions in life, uh, selecting a mate, selecting a career, uh, uh, where you're going to live, you know, how does that fit into the bigger perspective of life? And if we look at Luke twenty two forty two, 42, what did Jesus Christ say in his most trying hour? And this is the example we can take for us. In Luke twenty two forty two, he said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And this is at the, at the point where Christ was about to be uh, sacrificed uh, uh, through crucifixion. And he said, give the decisions over to the Father. So we must recognize that there's a greater purpose being worked out. We don't always see the big picture. I'm reminded, of, this has to be 20, 30 years ago, there was a country thong, a song, maybe it's since then, Thank God for Unanswered Prayer, that Sometimes it's a really, really good thing. And the unanswered prayer was, in fact, perhaps the best answer. That you didn't get what you wanted. Because if you got what you wanted, you could be in a heap of trouble. So there is a greater purpose working out. We must recognize that and ask God to show that to us when appropriate. And accept it if we don't hear uh, an indication, if we don't uh, come across that indication. Of course... The way to do that is point number five. And point number five is, and it's really complicated, it's called pray. You know how many times people are in a predicament and they don't pray until they get in the predicament? Now, 
I got to say, I'm, I'm like that. You know, I, I don't, I pray more often, like the one kid on the video that said, I prayed a lot in one second uh, before going through this big rubber band ride where it flung me off into the outer space wherever he thought he was going. So the whole concept here is, is to pray before you make the decision instead of, please help me avoid the aftermath of the terrible decision I made without praying in the first place. So point five is to pray. Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5.17. I want to read this in two different translations. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It says quite simply, pray without ceasing. Does that mean from our moment that we wake up in the morning, we start praying? And all day long, we continue praying until we fall asleep at night. Let's take a look at a little different translation. I looked at the Common English Bible. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it's translated, pray continually. Meaning, continually as the need arises. As you should and as you could. It doesn't mean that you're praying every second of every minute of every hour of every day. Although, many people do pray frequently throughout the day. So number point number five on making on decision making is to pray because that will help provide clarity to your thinking. I get asked questions from time to time. Some of these are local. Some of these are far away. <clears throat> okay, most of them are from far away. Uh, and whether it's a text message or an email or a telephone call. And, and I remember myself with the first time I ever asked a minister a question. And I get kind of irritated by, by, by his response after I asked the question. He says, well, did you pray about it? Well, well, of course I did. You know, I was like, what kind of implication is it that I wouldn't have? Um, <clears throat> but it's surprising how often we pray after the issue instead of before the issue. So we do want to, <clears throat> uh, we do want to give that, uh, give the frequency of our mind. Now, the first thing in the morning, of course, and, and I'm going to refer back to the, uh, to the message I gave on uh, five kinds of prayer. But the first thing is, is, is uh, uh, being thankful. And we can refer back to that. And then the last of the five things uh, was about me. So I put all of those other things first, but, but never forgetting to be thankful. And then going down the list of praying for those who point the way, those who have the rule or instruction over us, those who are weak among us, and then finally ourselves. So, so there are things, if we put those in priority order, we can avoid a difficult situation. <clears throat> I got two more of those phone calls this week from far away because their decisions led them into um, a place that they would say was between a rock and a hard place. They were in the horns of a dilemma. They were between the devil and the deep blue sea. They had Hobson's choices right before them. They had a catch-22. Now, what do we do? <clears throat> Let's take a look at the last bit of advice here in John 15 and verse 16. In John 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and their fruit should remain, that whatever you ask in the Father, the Father in my name, he may give you. Well, it is important to remember that God first chose us, and now we're to follow him. And when we're presented opportunities every day to make right choices, then to follow the precepts of God. And God will honor his commitment, his choice of us, as we stand to become the inheritors of his kingdom.